I'm Bruce Edwards, and welcome to this podcast produced by the International Monetary Fund. In this program, inventor and futurist Ray Kurzweil talks about how artificial intelligence is helping overcome our human limitations. That's the purpose of technology, and we're the only species that creates technology. That was enabled by this expansion of the neocortex two million years ago. We used that additional neocortex to invent technology. The first technology was language, so we could share ideas. But technology is a body and brain extender. Ray Kurzweil has shared some of his own ideas over the past few decades. His famous music synthesizer in the 1980s was the first to accurately recreate the complex harmonic structure of a grand piano. He invented speech recognition machines and the flatbed scanner. But Kurzweil is also an entrepreneur and was invited to the IMF World Bank annual meetings to join in a panel discussion on how new technologies are shaping the global economy. I began our conversation asking Mr. Kurzweil if intelligent machines, or AIs as they're called, will mean fewer jobs. Well, I have a different vision of technology. It's not us versus them. I think we're already merging with intelligent technology. You know, these AI futurist movies, you've got the AI versus the humans for control of the world. And we, that's not how it's rolling out. We don't have one or two AIs in the world. We have right now two to three billion, and they're making us smarter. You know, I had to take my bicycle to the computer at MIT when I was an undergraduate. Now we carry them in our pockets, and the kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to all of human knowledge with a few keystrokes. Uh, very few of us could do our jobs without these brain extenders, which is what they are. Uh, and that's how we use our tools. We couldn't reach fruit at that higher branch, so we invented a tool that extended our physical reach. Who, who of us could build a skyscraper with our bare hands? So we have tools that leverage our muscles, and now they leverage our minds to extend the very nature of our thinking. Uh, but this whole this, this concept of, of uh, overcoming, uh, you know, human limitations. Uh, do you think that that is, in fact, a natural process? Well, how many natural limitations have we already overcome? I mean, we, we're doing planetary-wide engineering, and we can solve problems that would be impossible without our machines. And so that's the purpose of technology. And we're the only species that creates technology. That was enabled by this expansion of the neocortex two million years ago. We got these large foreheads that gave us, a, we were already doing a great job being primates. We used that additional neocortex to invent technology. The first technology was language, so we could share ideas. Uh, and we've now created more and more powerful means of creating and sharing language and scientific ideas. And uh, But technology is a body and brain extender. That's, and we're getting more and more intimate with it. But uh, as we you know, as the machines become smarter and, and do things better than humans, uh, what will become of the workforce? We've done that already. How many jobs circa 1900 exist today? Uh, the weavers in England in 1800 looked around and saw, my goodness, these jobs are spinning thread and weaving cloth and our jobs are going to go away. And they did. If I were oppression futurist in 1900, I'd look around and say, well, two thirds of you work on farms and factories. That's now down to less than 10%. Uh, people go, oh my God, I'm going to be out of work. And I'd say, well, don't worry, you're going to get jobs doing podcasts and creating web applications and mobile devices and uh, websites and data analytics. Nobody would have any idea what I'm talking about. The political problem is this. People can look around and see jobs that are going to go away because of emerging technologies like self-driving cars. Happens to be true. Uh, but employment's gone up. Uh, you know, we have greatly multiplied uh, employment in the United States, even percentage-wise. So in the last century, we've gone from 30% to something like 43%. And the new jobs pay more than 10 times as much in constant dollars, and they're more interesting. We're redefining the nature of work. But isn't, uh, you know, redefining the nature of of work seems... Uh, like it's a, a luxury that, that people with jobs and, and or money 
uh, have and all those people that that haven't been exposed to sort of the opportunities of, of the new economy like what happens to them the idea of a job is not an end in itself it's a means to an end so it's a means to re to distribute wealth uh, perhaps it's a means to actually do something that's gratifying that you have a passion for uh, and we're in the process of redefining that musicians now have, have employment because websites need music and yeah. videos need music and yeah. graphic artists are in great demand and so it's it's enabling creativity it's enabling communication it's enabling easy access to markets if you're a musician you can put your music out there for free and the economic statistics are that employment even defined the old-fashioned way is at an all-time high uh, and more and more of the jobs are jobs that give us gratification not everybody and I'm, and there are dislocations and I think there's a lot of anxiety about this and I think that's fueling some uh, unrest uh, but people actually think that things are getting worse I commented on this to my in the panel at the IMF today uh, and that's absolutely not the case. Poverty is down, education's way up. Uh, all of these statistics are moving in the right direction. Even uh, war and peace, which is the most peaceful time in human history. And you know, you listen to the public airwaves and people talk about it's the most violent time in human history. Well, our information about violence and about what's wrong with the world is expanding exponentially. Uh, but the reality is the, the world is getting more prosperous. Just since World War II, poverty is down 80% worldwide, and there's many statistics like that. Hmm. So, I mean, the IMF released its projections uh, this year for, you know, the world economy, and, and again, it showed that generally growth is, is low, and it's been low for several years now. With with all that the technology offers uh, in terms of innovation, why do you think we're not seeing that economic growth? Or is it the, something that you raised in the panel discussion as well today was that suggested that we perhaps aren't capturing th this? Well, we're absolutely not capturing it in information technology. I mean, you can buy an iPhone or an Android phone that's twice as good as the one two years ago for half the price. But when I spend $200 for a smartphone, that counts for $200 of economic activity, despite the fact that it's thousands of dollars of information technology circa a few years ago and billions of dollars circa a few decades ago, and we don't capture that. So then economists say, okay, it's a strange world of information technology that's a little bit different, but you can't eat it, you can't wear it, you can't live in it. All of that's going to change as well and, and is in the process of being changed. I mean, we already see some benefits of that. You can buy very high quality clothes for very low prices because of the automation that's come to creating textiles. Uh, that'll become uh, supercharged when we have 3D printing of clothing and modules to snap together housing. And uh, there's a whole new automated uh, agriculture revolution called vertical agriculture coming with AI controlled buildings. and uh, none of that's captured because a dollar is of goods is still a dollar of goods, even if it's equivalent to thousands or millions of dollars of products, uh, you know, a while ago. I, I was very excited as a teenager after having saved up from my paper route for years to spend a few thousand dollars to get an Encyclopedia Britannica. And here were these 30 beautiful volumes with thousands of entries, and, and I loved information. Uh, well, now you have a much better encyclopedia, and that's just one of thousands of free information services, which counts for nothing in economic activity because we don't pay for it, and we completely ignore that and overlook it. That's very interesting. It's, it's sort of like with uh, technology sort of driving this new economy, we haven't really sort of sorted out how we measure the new economy, right? Well, correct. I mean... Uh, Information technology right now has approximately a 50% deflation rate. That is, by the way, why I think we're keeping inflation in check, not necessarily smart policies by the Fed. It's this, this pervasive deflation rate, and the influence of it is expanding. So there are industries like manufacturing is not quite an information technology, but we use so much information technology in it that it's become so efficient that costs are coming down. 
uh, and it's subject. And so this deflationary force is keeping inflation in check and provides fantastic value. I mean, this kid in Africa who spent fifty dollars for a smartphone has access to incredible resources. He's got more computing than the NASA space program a few decades ago and information services that didn't exist at all just a few years ago. Uh, and we completely ignore that. We don't factor that in. Economics was based on the economics of scarcity, which in fact described the world economy centuries ago. And we have this emerging information technology, which is a, a, an economics of abundance, where we get twice as much for the same cost each year. And we need different economic models for that. Thank you very much. My pleasure. That was inventor and futurist Ray Kurzweil. You can watch the webcast of the IMF World Bank Annual Meeting Seminar entitled Technology, Innovation and Inclusive Growth at IMF.org. You can also hear more podcasts like this one while you're there or use your favorite podcast app and search for IMF Podcasts.